and the profession the matter of McKenna Sinkova and Secretary of State for Work and Pension? Yes, my Lord, um, I appear, as you know, for Ms Sinkova, along with Mr Castle, who appeared uh, in the upper tri tribunal below. We're instructed by Lee Day. My learned friend, Ms Smythe, appears for the defendant uh, at the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, as she did below, together with Mr Mackay, yes. instructed by the GLD. Well, yeah. we've read the upper tribunal's decision, we've read the skeleton arguments, and we've looked at the regulation and the withdrawal agreement and the most of most important of the authorities. I'm grateful, my lord. In, in terms of timings, uh, my learned friend and I have agree agreed a split where I'll take uh, up until the first hour tomorrow, and she will leave me approximately 45 minutes for a reply. Um, as you've seen, in terms of bundles, the material before the court in terms of the factual material is mercifully slight, but it's one of those cases where that reveals um, issues of uh, hideous complexity, as is shown by the size of the authorities' bundles, and I'm afraid uh, that's a reflection of the Byzantine nature of EU social security word, and that's before we get to the other B word, which we're going to have to deal with as well. I would suggest that no claimant representing themselves could ever hope to navigate through the types of issues but raised by this case, and it's uh, lucky for Miss Simcova that she had um, the assistance before the upper tribunal of first the Child Poverty Action Group then through and Mr Castle all acting pro bono because I very much suspect without that we wouldn't be here today. Um, this uh, case, like most EU social security cases in my um, fairly lengthy experience of them, <laughs> raises a series of pretty knotty legal issues. I think the dispute before the court really boils down to this. Whether and when a court is obliged to look at a scheme of benefits to see if it is built from components to which uh, Regulation 883 2004, I'm going to call that the coordination regulation, applies, even if those components are meshed together with other elements to which that regulation does not apply, and even if the appearance of the components together is a, a single scheme of benefits. So it's, it's really about severance, this case. The Child Act, you, you will explain in due course, I hope, what you mean by severance. I will, my lord. I will, because it is the issue at the heart of the case. The child element of universal credit about which we're arguing is, as Judge Jacobs correctly accepted below, the descendant of child tax credit. You'll see that paragraph 47. And child tax credit was litigated before the CJEU, the infraction proceedings of Commission in the UK, and those infraction proceedings established that notwithstanding the fact that it was non-contributory, notwithstanding the fact that it was means-tested, notwithstanding the fact that it had tapering provisions that effectively led to reducing amounts of payment as your income went up, notwithstanding all those factors, it was still a family benefit. And HMRC, the administrators of child tax credit, accepted rightly in 2016 that that meant that that benefit was exportable in line with the coordination regulation. And that is notwithstanding the fact that the relevant eligibility requirement for child tax credit, the relevant regulation govern, governing uh, uh, entitlement through responsibility for a child, is formulated in exactly the same way as Regulation 4 of the Universal Credit Regulations that's before us today. So export was achieved in relation to child tax credits in consequence of the finding that the regulation applied, notwithstanding the fact that it had exactly the same entitlement architecture. Yeah, don't deal with it now, but you'll explain to us how exportability arises under Reg 883, whether it's through Article 67 or something else. We'd be interested just now how it actually comes about. It's the combined effect of Article 1.1, the definition uh, that that contains and the provisions it contains about how you're to assess a household, yeah. where the household is split across borders, yeah. combined with the export rule in Article 67. That's how it works. And effectively, those provisions disapply any inconsistent domestic test of household residence. That's exactly what they were designed to do, because one of the key objects of the regulation was to address that situation where the family straddles borders. You have a worker in one state. Is there state. any case law on Article 67? 
there's lots of case law in Article 67. If it helps, this court considered Article 67 and the exportability of family benefits in a case called Carrington, which is in the bundle where I appeared for the Secretary of State, for HMRC and the Secretary of State. You're going, are you going to do it? I don't want to take someone else. It's, it, what, what that case was about was whether, how long is it exportable for, or can you keep exporting it once the law that's applicable to you changes? And HMRC succeeded in persuading this court that once you move, you keep the benefit, but if the law applicable to you changes, you then have to look to your new state for the benefit. So that's, the, that's if it were, the, the qualification on exportability for those type of benefits. Carrington, I can give, I can give the court the reference. It's, it's, if I may say so, a masterly analysis of various provisions by uh, Sir, Launcelot, Sir Launcelot Henderson um, of the Social Security Coordination Rules. No doubt accepting most of my learned phone submissions, but fortunately we're not in a situation where the competent state has changed, because this is a benefit where the competence is fixed through the place of residence of Miss Simcova. She is in the UK, and the UK has been the relevant competent uh, uh, state throughout, so we don't need to deal with the, the complexities of someone obtaining a benefit and then moving that pertains in Carrington. And of course all of the cases we're going to see that have arguments about export, going back to the original case of Newton, are all about factual circumstances where someone gets a benefit and then either seeks to export it with themselves by moving to France, the facts of Mr Newton's case, or pointing to the fact that their family is abroad and the benefit should be paid abroad. So <coughs> the child uh, tax uh, uh, credit element was exportable. And the question that arises is what happens when child tax credit is spliced together with other things? Uh, does that effectively operate to change the um, essence of the benefit in question? Does the family benefit vanish under the weight of the overall scheme? Or does the coordination regulation require you to investigate whether in that architecture there is still subsisting the old family benefits, surviving as a distinct component. Now, we say that issue arises in general, but it must rise with particular vigour when it is so clearly established that the predecessor benefit, child tax credit, is an exportable benefit, and where all the changes that have occurred have been in relation to subject matter that the regulation treats as being irrelevant for the purposes of <coughs> classification. By that I mean, under the scheme of the regulation, as we'll see, means testing is irrelevant to whether or not a benefit is or is not a social security benefit. Tapering provisions are irrelevant to whether or not a benefit is or is not a social security benefit. The mode of application, if you have to apply for more than one benefit at once, or effectively there's one procedural gateway to a bunch of separate entitlements. That's irrelevant. And all of those things must be irrelevant, because once you accept, and I think a lot of this case is going to have to be conducted, like most arguments about severance, by reference to some thought experiments, once you accept you could have, let's say, a profusion of benefits. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, there are ten separate benefits, one addressing each of the risks in Article 3 of the regulation. Let's assume that they each have their own means tests. They each have their own tests of income and what counts as capital or household resources. They each have their own procedure for application. And suppose the state says, that's all too complicated. We want to have one means test. We want to have a common approach to income to make this system rational. We'll have a single means test. We'll have a single test of income. We'll have a single mode of application. Does that process of bringing those hitherto separate benefits under the same regime of tapering, the same regime of means testing, alter the essential elements of the underlying components? That's really the question posed by universal credit, because that's effectively what's occurred here. And the complexity here stems from the fact that universal credit assembles one thing that was plainly a social security benefit, charge tax tax credits, two things that were plainly special non-contributory benefits. I'll explain what those are in due course. And three schemes of social security that were under the scheme of the regulation social assistance. 
all six benefits were non-contributory and means tested. And the question is, effectively, does bringing those together under a common envelope of a common means test, a common set of tapering provisions, etc., making the benefits speak to each other directly in the same legislation, does that change what's going on? Now, you've seen the notes that we've submitted. Let me say something about that. First of all, I should apologise to the court and my lovely friend because it's apparent in hindsight we should have produced it much earlier. Certainly should. Yes, and, and I apologise unreservedly. The fault is, the fault is mine. Um, <clears throat> but um, we think those points of detail in relation to the interaction between the regimes are critical factors when the court comes to actually ask. Well, I think if you're going to rely on the note, Mr. Dunmer, first of all, you need to provide us with the statutory provisions that you refer to, not all of which are in our bundle. We, we have those. And ones. secondly, Ms. Smythe needs a proper opportunity to Of course she does, deal my with it. And I've discussed the matter with Ms. Smythe, and I am in obvious and complete agreement that she should have time to answer it in writing, to provide whatever uh, details she, she thinks are necessary, so that the court has before it the full techie detail of the interaction between child tax credit and uh, uh, universal credit. Because if we get to a question of severance, and if you think there's traction in my argument, there's been an error in approach of the tribunal judge, then you're going to want to understand the detail of that to work out to what extent it really is identifiably the same benefit. Uh, and that seems to me, uh, ultimately, to be an unavoidable exercise. As we understand it, the basic position is <coughs> that um, eligibility for one disqualifies you, eligibility for universal credit disqualifies you for CTC, it takes over. CTC is still available as a legacy benefit for those who had claimed it by a certain time and who have never claimed universal uh, credit. The two benefits speak to each other in all kinds of ways about transitional provisions, continuing entitlements. And the basic conditions of entitlement of the regimes are the same. That's most conspicuous in relation to the um, well-known two-child rule, which was introduced across the two benefits and only the two benefits, only in relation to the child element at the same time. But there are numerous other features. And I'm going to ask my learned friend, Mr. Castle, in line with the practice that Junior should be doing some more advocacy. I hope I'm not giving him a terrible hospital pass. I'm going to ask him to explain the provisions in the supplementary note because uh, he's the uh, monkey and I'm the organ grinder in that respect. So uh, <coughs> that's how we intend to proceed, my lord. Um, and of course, my learned friend should have the time she requires to answer those points uh, in writing. Our essential point is the principal differences between the schemes are in relation to procedure, how you apply for universal credit. They're in relation to means testing and tapering, and they're in relation to what counts as income, assets, household resources, and those factors are all irrelevant to benefit classification. And that is one of the fundamental errors uh, in paragraphs 47 and 48 of the Upper Tribunal Judgment, uh, and in particular, the failure to appreciate in the light of the Drake case, amongst others, that those matters were neither here nor there. So um, <coughs> that's the core issue of severance, if you like. The issues of severance and categorisation are given, I would suggest, then further complexity by Brexit sitting on top, because we have this um, uh, uh, the knotty issue about the scope of Article 158. Um, we say that this is a case that ordinarily in the world before the 1st of January 2020 would have uh, yelled out for a reference. The principles of severance contained in the CJU Jurisprudence Commission and Parliament, the Bartlett case and the comments of Advocate General Dulatour in the CG case all show there's a very real issue there. And the question is whether or not there's a lacuna in Article 158 of the Withdrawal Agreement such that if you got your reference in time before IP completion day, you can get a reference. If your case arises in relation to exactly the same provisions after IP completion date, you can get a reference. But if you're unlucky enough to have started a case before IP completion day, 
that only reveals the point of referability after IP completion date, the court has no power to make a reference. That, we say, is a lacuna. And to any community law lawyer, that screams out as a triumph for form over substance. And we'll see when we come to the withdrawal agreement how straightforward the read across is in this particular area. This is the purest of all the pure forms of continued application of EU law. Why? Because Article 31 of the Withdrawal Agreement basically says, if you're in personal scope, the regulation continues to apply with full force. That's all it needs to say. That's all it does say. And there are some quite unusual provisions in Title 3 of Part 2 about continued organic development of the um, uh, interpretation of the regulation that I will show you in due course. But that, we suggest, is both itself a referable issue as to the scope of Article 158, as well as a gateway to... I was wondering about that. <laughs> yes, well, we said as much in our skeleton. We think, we think there is an issue of interpretation about Article 158. Um, particularly, and my Lord... There's always a preliminary question which sets out, does the court have jurisdiction? That's the question. So. Yes. And there have been a number of those types this of questions. Is, all, I mean, just in strict form, formal terms, we're dealing with a piece of international law. And the European Court of Justice is the dispute resolution mechanism under this provision of international law. Yes. That's a withdrawal agreement, and that's the mechanism for resolving it. In, in, for us, it's international law. Of course, for the Europeans, it's... Yes. It's a mixture of European law yes. and international law. Yes, but the provisions of international law make it absolutely plain that the procedure is to be operated just okay. like the article, yeah. the old procedure, yeah. and uh, with one one change, and that is that there's no final court obligation in Article yes. 158. So there are really two issues that arise in relation to it. As uh, Lord Justice Lewis reflected in the Point Advance Commission, there's the question... <laughs> effectively, yes. scope of Article 158, and then the ordinary test of, is this a referable problem? Um, I mean, one would have thought that if, if the court's got jurisdiction to deal with the matters before and jurisdiction to deal with the matters afterwards, and given that this would apply, the answer would apply to Brits working abroad, it will want to take jurisdiction. You'd have thought so. It is a very strange lacuna uh, otherwise, uh, and it um, and this will be familiar to my lord from the C, uh, from the AT case. It runs up against the principle of impact Austria, which is basically if you have to start new proceedings in order to trigger the power to obtain a remedy in a case uh, that would otherwise call for a reference, that requirement for multiple proceedings is itself a um, an impediment to effective protection. And one has to stand back and say, how much sense does this make? The whole point of the withdrawal agreement is about securing continuity of rights in certain areas. The whole reason a right to refer is provided in relation to part two and the Northern Irish Protocol alone is because those are the areas in which the continuity of the law with whatever qualification the withdrawal agreement provides for is intended. So to do that while simultaneously taking a great big bite out of the middle of the donut doesn't seem to make a great deal of sense. So that's a, a sketch um, in outline um, of the issues arising. Can I just make a few headline points about the approach to the law, which is really at the, the heart of all of this? And forgive me if I'm um, giving the Court of Appeal um, a lecture in motherhood and apple pie, but um, I, you know, I've done the checks and it doesn't look like you've been unlucky enough to have had to grapple with these regulations before. And so it might be sensible just to set out some sort of headline stall about how to deal with Regulation 883 and, and how it operates. So I think there's completely common ground between um, the Secretary of State and us that the function of the coordination regulation is not harmonisation of Social Security. It is coordination. And it operates by a series of crude um, uh, tools, or relatively crude tools, the first question you have to ask is whether someone falls within personal scope, and that's set uh, very widely. The second thing you have to ask is whether or not the question arises in relation to one of the coordinated benefits. And um, 
you also had to ask whether it is a benefit or social assistance. So you're looking for one of the 10 topics set out in Article 3, and you're looking to check that what is in fact in play is effectively a scheme of rights rather than a scheme of discretionary assistance. That then may um, prompt um, problems or questions of classification. Uh, problems or questions of classification may be, does this scheme address one of the risks in the regulation at all, or does it address some other risk like poverty and only poverty? Or it may prompt a problem of which risk is addressed. And that is a particularly rich area of jurisprudence, particularly the fissure between invalidity benefits and sickness benefits. And the history of Regulation 883 and 1408-71 before it is one of never-ending uh, battles about whether or not something's an invalidity benefit or a sickness benefit for reasons that will become plain momentarily. The reason why classification is important under the scheme of the regulation is that classification then tells you which chapter you're in in the regulation. And each chapter has a distinct set of rules about payment across borders, cross-border situations, overlapping benefits, counting of periods of employment or residence in another member state. There are different rules depending on the different type of benefit. And that's why there are the endless debates about classification, because you need to know which chapter of the regulation you're in to then apply the rules that are specific to that type of benefit. But one of the universal tools of the regulation is export. It's basically a foundational rule of the regulation that you should be entitled to export benefits if you can show that you're entitled to benefits from the relevant competent institution. And because of the court's expansion of the scope of the regulation in the early 1990s, in the case of Newton, into non-contributory benefits, which had hitherto been thought to be social assistance rather than social security, the legislature invented a new category of benefit called special non-contributory benefits. Special non-contributory benefits have their own substantive criteria that are to be satisfied on top of the Article 3 criteria, and they have their own procedural requirements. They have to be listed in the specific annex. But once you can show that something is substantively a special non-contributory benefit, it becomes unexportable. So the member states basically created this new category in order to address the <coughs> interstices between true social security and social assistance and to provide for a category of social security benefit that couldn't be exported. And child tax credit... So the non-exportable ones are social assistance and SNCBs. SNCBs. Now, the, 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 the importance of that is the rest of the rules in the regulations continue to apply to SNCBs. So if, you're, if, you, if you want to rely upon, let's say, residence or service in another member state and there's a rule about aggregating service in... You know, periods of employment in the Netherlands, you can rely upon that in order to show entitlement to the SNCB. So they remain coordinated by the regulation, but the regulation's cardinal export rules are qualified. <coughs> now, some of these concepts are very broad indeed. Family benefits are very broadly uh, 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 defined, and that led to reform of the regulation to introduce special overlapping benefits rules, we'll see in Article 68. The key point is the benefit has to be conferred of as of right. And an instance of something that isn't a benefit conferred of as of right would be, for instance, assistance under Section 17 of the Children's Act, because that's entirely discretionary, both as to whether or not to make any payment and as to the amount. And you get, therefore, to a two-stage test. You have to show something addresses the Article 3 risk and that it is social security, not discretionary social assistance. And that explains why some benefits pass the first limb. They are non-discretionary, but fail the second limb because they're not addressed to one of the risks. Housing benefits, a classic example. Housing benefit is not directed to one of the 10 risks. It is awarded as of right. It is calculable. 
to, to, to by reference to your circumstances in exactly the way that lots of other these benefits are calculable, but because it doesn't address one of the risks, it is treated as being social assistance under the scheme of the regulation. Now that word social assistance is one that I invite you to note straight away. You need very considerable caution uh, in approaching because it is not a term used consistently by EU legislation. We will have to briefly look at the Citizens' Rights Directive and a case in particular called Bray that makes it plain that the concept of social assistance in the context of the CRD is much wider. And in fact, it's clear from Bray and Commission in the UK that social assistance embraces not just special non-contributory benefits in the coordination regulations terms, but also actually core social security benefits, including child tax credit. So child tax credit is simultaneously social security under the regulation and social assistance under the CRD. Well, I think in your skeleton you tell us what social assistance is not, but I don't think you tell us what it is. Oh, under, that's under Regulation 883. That's because, and my Lord's quite right to pick, it, pick, it, pick up on it now, under the scheme of the regulation, it is a residual definition. It's only ascertained by working out first whether or not something is social security. Uh, if it's social security, you also test whether or not it's an SNCB. And only if it's not social security is it social assistance. Whereas, confusingly, under the scheme of the CRD, it is more of a positive definition, and you look in effect as to whether or not it's non-contributory, means-tested, etc., because those are features all point to it being social assistance. So the two instruments work in a very different way, and it makes for some confusion. It also makes it extremely unsafe to point to the case of uh, uh, CG, which is a case under the Citizens' Rights Directive, say the, the Court of Justice accepted it was social assistance in that case, and then say, aha, well, it must be social assistance here. It simply doesn't follow. Uh, and the Advocate General's famous footnote um, makes that plain, if nothing else does. Now, um, it's not hard to understand the free movement of workers, free movement rationale, understanding the export rule. You only have to think of a kind of conventional cross-border worker scenario. Let's say the worker lives with their family in the Republic of Ireland. They work in Northern Ireland. And as a result of their work in Northern Ireland, under Article 11 of the regulation, the UK is the competent state for the payment of benefits. They're affiliated to the UK system through their work in Northern Ireland. But a rule says you can't be paid the benefits because your family or you aren't residing in the UK. And it's exactly those types of rules that the coordination regulation requires to be disapplied so that you can, for instance, get family benefits for your family who are living across the border away from the place of work or if you're working abroad away from your place of residence. And Article 67 is an instance of that rule. So we have exactly that situation here, and it's plain if it had been CTC, then the rules would have been uh, set aside. At that juncture, I, I can perhaps show you in the authorities bundle at um, tab 46. The missive from HMRC. You'll appreciate one of the one, one of the things that's happened with the change to universal credit is that HMRC, that used to administer child tax credits, is handed over to DWP. So this is HMRC's statement about the application of Article 67 and how it provides for export. And if you look at page 1243, you can see an example given in relation to Alfredo, a Spanish national who's living and working in the UK, but Isa and the couple's three children reside in Spain. Isa does not. That's exactly our factual scenario. And the analysis is, because it's a family benefit coordinated, they should claim in the UK and they'll be entitled, notwithstanding the rules that suggest they have no entitlement because... Um, Alfredo does not live with his uh, child in the UK. 
So the rights come directly from Article 67, not from the 2013 regulations. A absolutely right. It's direct applicability in all its glory. One of the reasons I asked the question at the outset, because I don't find Article 67 particularly clear in its renvoi back to in accordance with national legislation and the principle of non-discrimination, is it saying, uses the word entitlement, you have an entitlement, then is it then saying you just get the entitlement you would have had back in the UK, however limited that is, or is it broader? This suggests it's broader. Yes, and we'll see how it works when we come to the regulations. Okay. We think actually the real heavy lifting is done by Article 1, Roman I. In the That's the provision with the exportability in it? Yes. But does that mean that you only get such exportability as you would get in domestic law, or does it create an independent freestanding right to exportability? The latter. It's a right to export and to set aside the domestic provision that is inconsistent with such export. So that would have been the position. Can I kind of just, I don't know, is that common ground? That that's the correct interpretation of Article 67? I, I'm not sure. I think you better ask Miss Smythe when she has her turn. No, no, I don't want to, I'm just... We'll take it in order. So, so that's how it would work <laughs> until universal credit. There's no, there's no debate about that, I don't think, um, unless they want to resolve from what HMRC says and say some, something different. And what, what's happened is all that's changed is effectively those benefits have been consolidated and brought together under common means testing provisions. Now, there is nothing new in looking at such a consolidated benefit and asking whether or not it's composed of component benefits or component parts that merit separate treatment despite their common wrapper. And that's what lies behind the whole Commission and Parliament Bartlett saga. Because there, there was a scheme of benefits, disability living allowance as it became, being incapacity benefit for broadband. There was a mobility component and a care component. And the debate was, effectively, whether or not they were separate components. And the Court of Justice, in the Commission and Parliament case, against quite a long run-up, I'll explain when we get to the case law, concluded that the mobility component was an invalidity benefit and properly listed as an SNCB. We get the last bit from the Bartlett litigation. Whereas the care component was, in fact, a health benefit and therefore subject to the special rules applicable to health benefits and incapable of being listed as an SNCB as such. So you had one part of the benefit that was an SNCB, non-exportable, and another part that was a health benefit, exportable. And there was further litigation. There was a case called Tolly that was involved in which was referred from well, the Supreme Court. What was decided as I read the decision in the Parliament case was that you've got a benefit which has characteristics of one type of benefit and characteristics of another. And because it has dual characteristics, you can't add it to the list. But, says the court, if you the United Kingdom, the member state, wish to redesign it, then you can. You can sever it and add the, se the right seven bit to the list. But it wasn't saying we, the court, sever it and say that part of it can go on the list. That's why I wanted to know what you mean by severance. Well, that's why you need to look at the case of Bartlett after Commission and right. Parliament. Because in Bartlett, the point came back before the court where the annex in question hadn't been updated. It still just referred to disability living allowance as a whole. And the court was effectively asked, is that sufficient in order to treat the otherwise potentially severable, because the legislation hadn't changed, mobility component from care component in order to make the mobility component incapable of export? And the court said, yes, that's fine. Even though they're still in the same scheme, and even though there's only one listing, you can treat them as separate, and therefore care component can be exported, mobility component cannot. That's why you've got to read the two cases together. And there was no legislative change in the interim. The nub is that on, if, there's, if it's severable, question mark, then it creates a freestanding right to, to a claimant, and it's not just a right for a member state to reclassify 
if they wish. That's right. It's a freestanding right for a claimant. And, and if the member state doesn't have a relevant annex uh, entry designating it as an SNCB, it will remain exportable until such time as there is such an entry. And it's capable of being validly so entered, which is not the case in relation to most stamp benefits. Because most of the things that fall within the SNCB category are invalidity benefits. And you'll, you'll see that. That's the foundational dispute in Commission and Parliament. It's about whether or not care benefits have been listed as SNCBs, because if they have, they shouldn't have been. And all the things that are listed in Annex 2 or 2A or whatever it was, I can't remember quite now, Regulation 1408, that were in substance care benefits were kicked out. That's, that's what the litigation was all about. It all goes back to horrendously complicated German-Austrian case law, Jauch and Molinar, about the difference between care benefits uh, and uh, invalidity benefits, sickness benefits and invalidity benefits. <coughs> so that's really the issue. Do we have to do severance of the kind that was done in Commission and Parliament and Bartlett? Do we have to look at the scheme and say, well, in fact, it's composed, not as in that case, of a social security benefit in an SNCB, but here, in fact, composed of a family benefit mixed with two special non-contributory benefits, so, so far, so like Commission and Parliament, but also three things that are benefits but not benefits directed at coordinated risks. Does that magic of splicing them together change the fundamental essence of the benefit? Uh, and we say it can't. Anything else is a recipe for avoidance. It's a recipe for um, losing sight of the fundamental issue, which is that there is a distinct component, albeit under common means testing provisions, addressing one of the risks under the regulation. How can it be different? How can the answer be different, depending on whether or not you have six benefits, all with identical means tests and all cross-referring to each other, or all of the same in one place? It doesn't make any sense. So you have to do an exercise of substantive investigation, and that means you have to start where you find a risk addressed by the regulation, and there plainly is one in relation to um, the child elements, and you have to ask if that component is severable. Because you can't, in our submission, evade the operation of the regulation by blending components together, unless the process of doing so is to fundamentally alter the nature of the benefit, which it hasn't here. And that's where uh, the note in our submission uh, comes in. <clears throat> so that's the, um, the, ra the rather long run-up. Obviously, the backdrop of Commission in UK gives this point particular piquancy because you know that the relevant predecessor benefit is a coordinated uh, family benefit. What are the main answers to it? The main answers to it are the tribunal's answer, which is... Everything has been blended to such an extent that the components have lost their previous identity, to which we say, well, the factors you point towards as justifying that conclusion, namely means testing, tapering, common income provisions, etc., are all factors that are irrelevant to classification. And they're all factors that were present in the benefit, albeit in different form beforehand, because child tax credit was means tested. It did have its own income rules. It did have its own tapers. So why should the change in the particular contents of those affect the fundamental change in the benefit? Secondly, my learned friend says, and there's no trace of this in the judgment, effectively all of this would generate huge complexity and make um, universal credit much more difficult to administer. And to that we say two things. We don't accept it because we think you can simply disapply uh, the relevant provision, okay, allowing for export, and the rest of the regulations work perfectly well in those circumstances. But secondly, if it's true, well, then that's the consequence of the law, and you can't plead the complexity and the difficulties created by the correct legal analysis as a basis for resisting that legal analysis. And then it said there'll be spillover into other benefits, and I'll explain in due course why we don't think that there are any such problems arising. So that's a very 
lengthy introduction. I hope it's merited by the complexity of the issues. Let me explain how I'm going to unpack it. First of all, I'm going to say something about... Sit down now. Yeah. Good luck with that one. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to start with something very quick on the facts, because there's nothing much in dispute there. Secondly, I'm going to take you through the tribunal well, I decision. Think we, we think we know what the facts are. They're found by the FTT. They're supplemented by Ms. Simkova's more recent witness statement. Um, there's obviously the point about whether we can look at circumstances which post-dated the Secretary of State's decision, but for the time being, we'll... Yeah, well, you understand that point is relevant only to the jurisdiction to refer, and we don't think it's improper to adduce those facts for that purpose. Um, the key thing on the facts is, of course, that the FTT, albeit for completely the wrong legal reasons, made all the findings of fact. Yeah, the right. case. So, need say nothing more on that front. I'm going to take you through back to the decision. I know you've read it, my lord, but I'm going to take you to just show you its basic structure first. Then I'm going to take you through the EU instruments uh, quite carefully. Then I'll take you through the withdrawal agreement, my topic four. There's a very, very short topic. Lord Justice Green will be particularly relieved, I think. We're not getting into Lipton or anything like that because we're all agreed that pre-IP uh, completion date authority is binding and that's that. Um, and then sixthly, I'm going to walk, um, Mr. Carlson's going to walk you through the, um, the note relatively briefly. And then I'm going to take you through the cases and the key propositions to be obtained from the cases. Then eighthly, I'll apply those to identify the errors of law. And that will be quite a short section having set out all the materials beforehand. I'll then pick up any reply points from the Secretary of State, and then lastly, the topic of the reference. So, I will save two pages that I had on the facts. You'll be delighted to hear. And move straight to my second topic, the Upper Tribunal read ruling. It's at Core 13, page 86. The central conclusion is first stated in paragraph one. The main issue is whether the child element, so there's mainly a focus on the child element, we're not attacking universal credit as a whole. Is a social security family benefit? I've decided it's not. And I've decided there's no power or need to make a reference. Um, skip over the facts. The legislation, this is a helpful review of part of the relevant legislation in relation to universal credit. It's important to note that the uh, uh, upper tribunal judge concentrated in particular on section eight, which deals with calculation of awards. That feeds into his core conclusion that the calculations would be different, therefore it's being blended. Uh, and um, then at section, at paragraph 10, he concentrates on the responsibility test that's identical to the test of entitlement under child tax credit uh, legislation. It's also a test of responsibility formulated in much the same way. The schedule to the Act says that can be fleshed out by regulations. And there you have, in Regulation 4, the relevance test. And that Regulation 4 is functionally the same. It's not word for word identical, but when you look at the provisions, they're a very close match. It's functionally the same as Regulation 3 of the Child Tax Credit Regulations. Then uh, you have the relevant provisions of EU law set out, and except these are the principal um, regulations of importance. The critical one is 1I3 uh, in our submission, as well as Article 67 but we'll look at the regulation in a moment. You then have the relevant provisions from the CRD at 16 to 18. Uh, e summarises the genesis of universal credit. F, paragraph 21, all binding, we're all agreed. And then there's a, a strange passage at 22 to 25, analysing the CRD cases. And this is a strange passage in a couple of respects. Firstly, the CJU conclusion that um, you see in social assistance is set out, but there is no mention in this connection of the careful passage in Advocate General de la Tour's opinion, pointing out, in light of Commission in the UK, that the child element 
may be categorised as effectively coordinated by the regulation. That passage was cited to the judge and doesn't appear in the judgment. And then um, the judge considers the case of Bray, which is the leading case in showing social assistance doesn't mean the same thing under the two instruments. And at 25, he rightly says, as the meaning of social assistance under the regulation is an hour of the two, it provides a useful mental check to ensure that it's not being interpreted too broadly. But then, as you'll see, literally nothing is done with that conclusion in the rest of the judgment. Then you have um, a review of the case law under the regulation, which until you get to paragraph 32, we think is, is um, unobjectionable, it's correct. Where things begin to go wrong is paragraph 32, and in particular, it's at the end of 32, where the judge suggests that because truly discretionary social assistance, like the Section 17 of the Children's Act, is vanishingly rare and has been replaced increasingly with schemes of entitlement that pass the first limb of the test because they're non-discretionary. It follows that for benefits in this country, the reference to an element of discretion is redundant. Well, that's not true. It's just less significant, as my example shows. But then this, and this is wrong, although the court has not used this language, one touchstone for classification is whether the purpose of a benefit is to provide a safety net at subsistence level. And that is wrong. It's wrong because the case law clearly establishes that even where there is a subsistence income function, if one of the other purposes of being pursued by the benefit in question is one of the coordinated benefits, it is a social security benefit. That is Hughes. That's Hughes, That's Hughes but most pertinently, it's commission in the UK. We'll see when we get to commission in the UK. The UK said, this isn't a coordinated benefit because its purpose is to address poverty. And it's means tested and it's tapered. And the CJU says, no, it is addressing poverty. It is means tested and tapered, but it's also uh, addressing the needs of family income. It's a family benefit. So that passage is, with respect, flat wrong. And the, the real proof positive that it's wrong is that the very need to invent the category of SNCBs is driven by the need to address the peculiarities of things that are both social security and social assistance that have this subsistence level income uh, feature. And that's one of the criteria by which SNCBs are tested. So that's uh, 33. <coughs> and then you see correct analysis of the breadth of the definition of family benefits. Hughes over the page is addressed. It says the meeting of family expenses not, need not be the only purpose of the benefit. Um, and then you get to a treatment of um, severance in relation to commission and EP and Bartlett. No real conclusions drawn from that other than at 38, there is no other authority of the ECJ that deals with severability. And that's not completely right because there is the passage in CG that points to the potential severability of uh, the child element. But other than that, it is correct. And he says that leaves me with the possibility that elements of what is treated as a single benefit in domestic law can be split for the purposes of EU law if they're severable. And we agree that he's right. The only indication of what may or may not be severed is that disability living allowance could be severed into its two components. And it's probably the clearest case of a benefit that is severable. And he says this, leaving aside adjudication and payment, because the two benefits were administered by a common application and common payment system. So that means the fact that universal credit has a single application form for all of its components is irrelevant. There was very little connection or interrelation between the mobility component and the care component. The one that comes to mind is the combined operation of the interrelation of the components of those with severe mental impairments under the Social Security Act 1992. And that one, I'm afraid, is beyond me uh, and demonstrates the much greater knowledge uh, of the upper tribunal judge. And then he says, severability was considered in the Al-Hashem case, 
which you'll see has featured heavily in, oh, well, heavily maybe overstating it, it's featured notably in my learned friend's skeleton. And Al Hashem is indeed a case in the context of arguments principally under the CRD, where um, arguments of severance were advanced very much as an afterthought. But what this passage uh, shows, the passage cited, and the case as a whole shows, is no more than that the test of severance failed on the facts of that case by reference to the particular circumstances of that benefit. And it's very hard to read Al Hashem when we come to it as containing any wider principle or guide other than that um, that benefit itself was not composed of separate components. And that's not surprising because ESA effectively was intended as part and parcel of the purpose of the benefit to move parties through financial incentives, etc., from the status of having limited capacity uh, uh, for work and work-related activity into the less um, uh, 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 lesser restriction of limited capacity for work. It was intended to effectively incentivize those with disabilities to skill themselves so that they could work. It was intended effectively to move the cohort, whereas nothing can effectively move the cohort of whether or not you have children or not. It's not part and parcel of the object of this, uh, this scheme of benefits, beyond, of course, the two-child rule which is intended to deter people from having more children um, if they're dependent on benefits. It, it's not a function of this scheme to move people between different categories. Then over the page, you get the core analysis, 40 to 48. 40 to 41 is really a summary of what the government says it was doing. It was consolidating the six benefits. It is a unified minimum subsistence benefit which simplifies the UK benefit system and aims to alleviate poverty, etc. All of that is true, of course. And then you get to the key questions posed by Mr. Castle. Is it severable, such that it should be considered to be a separate benefit? And if it is severable, is it a family benefit because of the child element? And his answer to the first question, 44 over the page, is no. The second question doesn't arise. But then this, which is, in our submission, fairly strange, if it did arise, in other words, if the child element was severable, the answer would also be no. The answers are the same because the reasoning is essentially the same. And with respect, that's impossible to find. If you've decided that it is severable, how can the answer be the same when your focal point is that much narrower? And he says, therefore, I deal with both questions together. And that, in our submission, is a strong pointer to the um, flavour of error that we have. The core reasoning, then, in our submission is at 47 to 48. <clears throat> Mr. Castle's right that it's a descendant. He doesn't accept that there's a discrete element they are discrete entitlements. He doesn't accept their discrete entitlements which relate to distinct risks. The, and, and here's the crunch reasoning. It's all about quantum. It's all about calculation. The elements of the maximum amount are not entitlements. They're amounts that form one part of a calculation that is subject to deductions, which determines entitlement. Children are taken into account when creating the pool that represents the maximum amount, along with the other elements. Well, that's no difference to having child tax credit and the amount of it dependent upon how much income you're receiving, whether income is from work or for some, from social security. It's exactly the same technique. What has changed? The child element then essentially loses its identity in that pool, which is subject to reduction as the deductions eat into the value of the pool. But if child tax credit is already tapering by reference to how much you earn or how much other benefits you receive, how is that any different? Well, wait a minute. Um, the, what... So I understand it. What you do is you construct the maximum. That's right. And then you make deductions from it. And those deductions can include how much you earn, for instance. Correct. So that, that's why I refer to it as a tapering provision. Yes. Because the object is not to have a hard cutoff of the kind that is thought to disincentivize yes. work. Yes. It's to lead to a progressive 
no, reduction in the amount of payment. So, so you, you're, let's suppose that your um, your maximum amount includes the standard allowance, the responsibility for children, housing, and other particular needs. And now you start making deductions. That's right. How do you tell whether you're deducting from housing costs, for instance, rather than the child element or special needs or anything else? So I think that's what the tribunal judge is saying when it loses its identity. You don't know what you're deducting from. If, you're, if you've got child tax credit and you're deducting from that, you can see what you're deducting from. But if you're deducting from an aggregate made up of all these different elements, how can you tell how much of the child benefit is left at the end of the process? Well, the answer to that, my lord, is that you could do a counterfactual. You can ask how much you'll receive uh, if uh, you are treated as um, being responsible for the child, and that will generate a certain sum, calculable, and how much you'll receive if you're treated as not entitled to the child, and that will result in a different sum. And the difference between the two is that part of the child element that um, is left after you use the common means testing and tapering provisions across the benefits. And that's not hard to calculate. It's the difference between the two sums. And with respect, that's essentially the same calculation you get in a tapered benefit like child's tax credit, dependent upon what other benefits you're already in receipt of. So lots of the benefits cross-refer to other forms of income and they treat benefits as forms of income. If the benefits are all separate, you will have a, an entirely um, uh, adventitious sequencing issue as to which has been claimed and received first, and then you treat that as income for the second benefit, and it reduces the amount under the tapering of that second benefit. That has nothing to do with the core questions of entitlement. And as we'll see in the case of Drea, the CJU say that provisions like that don't detract from the fundamental essence of the benefit in question being the Social Security benefit. So just... You start by taking deductions against an aggregate sum. That's right. Your analysis is that you could take exactly the same fact scenario, remove dependent children, and you come to a different figure, which is right. X minus Y, and that the increment, you say, is attributable to the child. Exactly. Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the impact on the calculation, and it is a calculation that will be generated by not treating the child in question as being effectively in the same household as Miss Sincova. There will be one sum that would be calculated if Marcus was living here. There's another sum that's calculated by the fact that she's effectively assumed to have no children. And the bit that's attributable to the child element is the difference between the two. And there'll be some cases when it may go all the way up to the maximum sum, and there'll be some cases when the number, the residual number, because of other benefits received, other income had, capital sums had, it would be much smaller, potentially zero. But that doesn't detract from its essence as a calculable sum attributable to the fact that Miss Simcoe is a mother with main responsibility for this child. And it, if it goes down to zero, there's nothing to export. You export what's left at the end. Do Absolutely. You? Absolutely, because what we're really talking about is whether in this country, because she's not actually exporting a benefit, Miss Simcova receives the sum of, let's say, £100 or £120. The extra increment being attributable to the fact that she has main responsibility for a child. So none of this seems to us to constitute any kind of impossible obstacle to calculation, because all you do is effectively do the calculation that assumes that the child is living with the mother in the UK, and that's the sum to which you're entitled. So it's the sum which comes out of the application of Section 10.1? Yes. The calculation of an award of universal credit is to include an amount for each child or qualifying young person for whom the claimant is responsible. Yeah. And then you've got the calculating calculation. That Absolutely. And that calculus, just like the calculus in CTC, is subject to the two-child rule. So effectively says you'll get some more up to your including your second child, but you won't get any more for a third child unless the third child falls within one of the exceptions. And the exceptions are exactly the same. 
and the changes are introduced at exactly the same time. Uh, they're identical. And that's one of the many pointers that these two schemes are absolutely the closest of close um, signals. <coughs> Then at uh, 48, uh, it says regulation 883-2004 is a coordination provision. It does not confer rights. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> regulation 883 confers the rights to export or benefits falling within it. It absolutely does confer rights, and domestic law that's inconsistent with it must be set aside. So it's not enough to say it takes domestic law and classifies it. That may involve severing, but it cannot involve the rewriting of domestic law. Yes, it can. That's exactly what happened to domestic law by dint of Regulation 40871 in the case of Newton. There was a rule precluding export of Newton. It was disapplied because it was inconsistent with the export rule that was, I think, Article 10 of the old Regulation 40871. So this uh, analysis is, uh, is wrong, and it also swings upon the basis that you have to imagine the creation of a hypothetical separate benefit. We don't think that that is the test, but even if that were the test, it's not a hard test to satisfy in the present circumstances because you simply imagine child tax credit with tapering and means testing provisions that replicate the tapering and means testing provisions in universal credit and take you to exactly the same place. It may be a different calculation because what counts as income has changed or what the income thresholds are, but that's the hypothetical exercise. And it's no answer to say it can't be said in that way. It's too embedded in the complicated structure of the calculation of entitlement to universal credit because it's not embedded in the structure of entitlements. It's embedded in the structure of calculation. Turning back, in, in, back into a child tax credit or a separate benefit would reverse history or amount to a substantial rewriting of the domestic legislation. No, it wouldn't. It would simply result in the disapplication of the parts of Regulation 4 that are inconsistent with the regulation. And thereafter, the scheme uh, operates exactly as intended. So that's the reasoning on the main issues. Uh, you see the reasoning at 49 and 50 on reference, and effectively, it's an issue of construction combined with no uncertainty. <coughs> Can I then turn to the coordination regulation? And you probably notice my clerks arriving with the thing I'd left behind. If you give me just 20 seconds to pull up my bundle. So uh, the regulation is in authorities 14. We've included the recitals uh, first up. And could I ask you to look first at page 257. It's recital 34 to 36 and then uh, 37. 34 explains that family benefits have a very broad scope and that that justifies, in order to avoid unwarranted overlapping benefits, the invention of uh, overlapping benefits rules. That's Article 68 that we'll see in a second. And then 37, as the Court of Justice has stated repeatedly, provisions which derogate from the principle of exportability of social security benefits, that's the SNCB provisions, must be interpreted strictly. This means that they can apply only to benefits which satisfy the specified conditions 
it follows that Chapter 9 of Title 3 of this regulation can apply to only benefits which are both special and non-contributory, that's Condition 1, and Condition 2 is listed in Annex 9 of the regulation. And that is, I think, in fact, a convenient point to jump ahead to look at those additional conditions. Uh, they're at page 298 of the Authority Bundle. Under Chapter 9, Special Non-Contributory Cash Benefits, And you can see from Article 1, and this goes all the way back to Newton, they'll apply to special non-contributory cash benefits which provided for under legislation, which because of its personal scope, objectives and conditions for entitlement, have characteristics of both social security and of social assistance. In other words, the social security characteristic is entitlement, automatic entitlement upon certain conditions being met. The social assistance characteristic is non-contributory, means-tested, directed at, at poverty and matters of that kind. But then it's defined in Article 2. These are the substantive conditions that have to be met. And they are required to be supplementary, substitute or ancillary cover against the risks covered by the Article 3 risks, which guarantee the persons concerned a minimum subsistence income. So you can see, necessarily, SNCBs in Lim 1 are about poverty. Or 2 solely specific protection for the disabled, closely linked to the said person's social environment in the member state concerned. And that means that certain disability benefits, even if they aren't means tested, uh, may fall within it if the quantum or basis of the disability benefit is designed to facilitate the problems of integration that a disabled person will have in the UK with its cost of living, etc. So to meet special needs. Um, cost, etc. And where the financing exclusively derives from compulsory taxation intended to cover general public expenditure, etc. So it's non contributory. And C are listed in Annex 10. And then if you go to Annex 10, that's page 311, and you scroll on to the UK entries, which are at 314, you'll see state pension credit. So that's both addressing the risk of poverty and old age. So it's an SNCB. Income-based allowances for job seekers. So that's addressing unemployment as a risk, but also minimum subsistence income. That's one of the SNCBs that are coordinated or consolidated by Universal Credit. Disability Living Allowance Mobility Component, that goes all the way back to Newton Commission, etc. That's not consolidated. And then Employment and Support Allowance Income Related. That is another one of the six. <coughs> so those are the SNCBs and how they come about. Then if we go back to Article 1... particular 1i at page 262, you see the definition of member of the family, and it's the third limb of that. And you can see how this operates. And again, it's another illustration of knowing why which chapter it is important, because, for instance, in um, 1 Roman 2, there's a specific rule that applies only to Title 3, Chapter 1, Sickness Benefit. But 1 Roman 3 is a general rule. It says, if under the legislation which is applicable under subparagraphs 1 and 2, a person is considered a member of the family or a member of the household only if he or she lives in the same household as the insured person, this condition shall be considered satisfied if the person in question is mainly dependent on the insured person or pensioner. So there you have the substantive test supplied by this regulation that operates in substitution for the test in the regulation. The test of main dependency. And that is the question of fact, as good luck would have it, in fact answered by the FTT. Then if we go on to Z in the definitions, at page 265, 
We can see the definition of family benefits. It's all benefits in kind or in cash intended to meet family expenses, excluding advances and maintenance payments and special childbirth and adoption allowances mentioned in Annex 1. And Annex 1 does not apply. Then you've got Article 2, which is the personal scope of the provision. It's all nationals residing in one member state who have been subject to the legislation of one or more member states, as well as to the members of their families. There's no debate that we're in scope. And then Article 3.1 sets out the uh, various uh, uh, topics uh, coordinated uh, sickness, maternity, invalidity, old age, survivor's benefits, accidents of work, death grants, unemployment benefits, and then uh, pre-retirement benefits, and lastly, family benefits. Unless otherwise provided in Annex 9, 11, this regulation shall apply to general and special social security schemes, whether contributory or non-contributory. In other words, unless it's an SNCB, this regulation will apply whether or not the regime is to... Uh, contributory or non-contributory. <clears throat> then it says at um, uh, uh, three, the regulation shall also supply to, uh, apply to SNCBs. And that's what, does that what does that mean? It means, that ultimately, it means that the regulation applies save for export rules. So again, if you, if you have to draw upon periods of service or something like that, or periods of residence, you may be able to points to other periods of insured residence. And then uh, Regulation 5, this regulation shall not apply to social and medical assistance. That's where social assistance come in, comes in. There's then an equal treatment rule in um, Article 4. There's a general provision. In Is there a recital which refers back to the meaning of social assistance? I don't know, but I'll check. I should know. So when I look for one, I couldn't quick whiz through. I couldn't find one. We'll do a tech search. I'm sure Mr. Castle is on it as we speak. But anyway, you're going to tell us what it means. <laughs> Some I, I am, yeah. It means anything that isn't Social Security or an SNCB in the scheme of this regulation. Well, that's what it doesn't mean, but what does it mean? Well, that's the problem, my Lord. It <laughs> is a residual definition. It's that which is left after you've eliminated those things that are Social Security or SNCBs. And I'll show you the cases that show that. <coughs> and there's a waiver of residence rule. Um, uh, then you've got Title II, and I'll, this is horrendously complicated, but irrelevant, so we can sk skate over it. All you really need to know is that Article 11 contains what is, if you like, a, um, a conflict of law uh, rule to determine which member state's legislation applies to any one person. Very complicated. There's a recent judgment of this course in a case called Harrington, not to be confused with Carrington, that addresses that subject. Um, but I don't think we need to bother you with that at the moment. And then you get to the various titles. So, for instance, if you look at page 271, chapter 1, you have all the various rules about sickness benefits. And this governs the old E101 form and what happens if you're abroad in France and can you get medical treatment in France and all those types of scenarios. Um, and then you have separate rules for invalidity, pensions. The pensions rules are obviously directed at um, uh, addressing um, the position if you've got pensionable service from your work in Italy and then France and then the UK, who's competent and how do you calculate them? So a different complexity. But the ones we're concerned with are the family benefit rules, which are back on at page 296, chapter 8, just before the SNCB provisions. There's two rules you need to see there. 67 a person shall be entitled to family benefits in accordance with the legislation of the competent member state, including for his or her family members residing in another member state as if they were residing in the former member state. So it's to exactly the same effect as Article uh, 113 on I3. And then, however, a pensioner should be entitled to family benefits in accordance with the legislation of the member state competent for his or her pension. So what does that mean? It means that if I'm living in Spain, that the UK is the competent state for my pension under the pensions rules, 
because let's say all my pensionable service was in the UK before I moved to Spain, it's the UK that remains responsible for paying any family benefits that are attached to my pension, notwithstanding the fact that it's not otherwise competent. That's what it means. It's a, a really good indicator of the Byzantine complexity of this regulation. Fortunately, we don't have to wrestle with that one uh, here. And then Article 68, yeah, I haven't quite followed that. The, the, the first sentence of Article 67 se seems to state a rule. The second sentence, beginning with however, presumably qualifies that rule. Yes. That's normally what however does. Yes. So, so the basic rule is it's where you're residing. Right, because that's the competent member state, is it? That's right. Right. Well, it will be in certain circumstances. Well, no. There will be a competent member state and a state of residence. They may not be the same place. So go back to my cross-border example of the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland yes. worker. Family benefits will be paid um, in accordance with the legislation of the competent member state. So in my example of a cross-border worker from Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, it will be the UK that will be paying family benefits. Right. But if the position is that another state is competent in relation to your pension, because of the particular rules relating to old age benefits, and that will turn upon your place of service, etc. It's that state, well, and not the state that is competent for all other purposes, that will be paying um, the family benefit. Right, but this, but that doesn't. Right? This that sentence does not apply to Miss Simcova no. because she's not a pensioner. Correct. Correct. Has no no relevance here. But it's it's an indicator of why these categorization arguments have the significance that they do, uh, along with you know, different rules on export and cross-border scenarios. And then uh, 68 are the rules in relation to overlapping benefits. And these control the scenario where, because of different members of families working, children may be entitled under legislation of more than one member state. Because obviously, if Miss Simcova was married to Mr. Simkova. Mr. Simkova was working back in Slovakia, and Slovakia provides for family benefits. You might have entitlement under both schemes of legislation. And that's what Article 68 is directed at. That doesn't arise here, um, but it's yeah. a complexity that my learned friend points to that says, well, if, um, if, uh, if this is a coordinated benefit, then the overlapping benefits rules may apply and they may result in a further reduction, etc. To which we say, and that's just a consequence of the regulation apply. That's what goes with it. Um, there are consequences. So um, that's the um, scheme of the regulation. The CRD, or Consumer Rights Directive, is the next citizen's rights. <laughs> they have been spending the rest of the week arguing about it. It's also called the CRD. Uh, uh, the Citizens' Rights Directive, Directive 2004-38, much litigated. Um, this draws upon social assistance for a very different purpose. The purpose uh, it draws it upon is effectively as a qualifier on rights of residence. Um, we don't have Article 7 in the bundle, but you'll see Article 7 when we get to Bray. But the basic scheme here is you have a right of residence if you're a worker or self-employed, or if you're economically inactive, um, but economically self-sufficient. And that covers retirees and all kinds of other people. And that subsists so long as you don't become a burden on the social assistance of the member state, and then there are provisions saying that you can't effectively treat your right of residence as automatically terminated just because you've made one call on the social assistance scheme of the member state. Then there's the equal treatment rule, uh, Article 24, and this is where um, lots of the um, litigation has been directed, and it's all been in the context of economically inactive people, because there's a general equal treatment rule that you're entitled to be treated as the same as nationals. So that's relied upon to say, well, I can have social assistance, thank you very much. 
But then, by way of derogation from paragraph one, the host member state shall not be obliged to confer assistance or social assistance during the first three months of residence. That's the Article 6.1 right of residence that everyone has as an EU national. You can go to, if you're an EU national, you can go to France or uh, um, Netherlands or wherever it is, maybe, without uh, having to um, uh, notify the authorities. Or, where appropriate, the longer period provided for in Article 14.4b. That's the period provided for for those who continue to be work seekers with a real prospect of seeking employment. Nor shall it be obliged prior to acquisition of the right of permanent residence to grants, maintenance, aid for studies, etc. So all of this is a qualification on the duties to provide social assistance pursuant to duties of equal treatment. And that has generated a mass of case law in which my learned friend Ms Smythe is definitely an expert. All the cases, my Lord Lord Justice Green will remember, like Dano and Alamanovich, about whether or not uh, uh, the economically inactive were entitled to equal treatment, etc. And in those cases, social assistance has been effectively defined to include anything that's non-contributory, means-tested, etc. So the very things that aren't social assistance under the regulation are under the CID. Next topic, the withdrawal agreement. We're all agreed that the facts of this case are pre-withdrawal agreement. So there are no questions of withdrawal agreement law arising at the point of time of the dispute arising. And there's certainly no question of retained EU law arising. And Miss uh, Sinkova's entitlements, at least when the dispute arose, are governed by old EU law. And that continues to apply that bites into nothing else of Section 16 of the Interpretation Act. And it's on that basis that she's entitled to continue to rely upon Article 67 and Article 1I3 of the regulation. And that is, I think we both agree, the approach of this court in the case of K Carrington, which is in Authorities Bundle Tab 42. But in order to understand why there's a relevant power to refer today, it's uh, important to understand how the coordination regulation survives under the withdrawal agreement. Um, I'm not going to tell the court about its judgment in AT, um, which is a very useful guide to how the withdrawal agreement works. What I am going to do is to pick up the ways in which social security are different. Uh, the withdrawal agreement, for our purposes, has two material parts. There's part one, which contains the material general principles. Article two, starts at page three, two, one. Two A defines union law. It's items one, two, and three. In particular, three acts adopted by the institutions that are relevant for present purposes. Article 4.3 provides that the provisions of this agreement referring to union law or concepts or provisions thereof shall be interpreted and applied in accordance with the methods and general principles of EU law. And then Article 4.4, this is what makes union law binding for the purposes of um, withdrawal agreements. Disputes. The provisions of this uh, agreement referring to union law concepts or provisions thereof shall, in their implementation and application, be interpreted in conformity with the relevant case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union handed down before the end of the transition period. It's that provision that tells you that the provisions of the withdrawal agreement are to be interpreted with the binding effects of the CJEU case law up to the 1st of January 2021. And then 4 or 5, a bit like section 6.2 of EUA says, in the interpretation and application of this agreement, the UK's uh, judicial and administrative authorities shall have due regard to the relevant case of the CJU handed down after the end of transition. And then there is the application of good faith at 5. And the definition uh, of union law, uh, which is union law as subsisting at the end of the transition period, unless provided otherwise. And we'll see that there's an unusual provision otherwise in part two. So the first title of part two, 
page 324 is citizenship. That's the topic of um, uh, AT. Uh, the one we're concerned with is Title Three. which starts at um, page 335. And it has the same structure as Title I and II. The first thing is a rule of personal scope in Article 31. There's no dispute. Miss Simcova is in scope because she's a union citizen subject to the legislation of the UK at the end of the transition period. So she's in scope, and so are her family members and survivors in consequence. So what are the actual rules? This uh, is, Article 31 is, if you like, the equivalent of Article 13 in uh, Title 1. The substantive rules are that the rules and objectives set out in Article 48, that's free movement of workers, and uh, Regulation Number uh, 987-2009, um, as well as Regulation 883-2004, shall apply. And so for present purposes, it's providing that both the relevant treaty rule, which has inspired Regulation 883, and the whole of Regulation 883 continues in force entirely unvarnished. It's not like Article 13, which makes some qualifications, etc. It's just a straightforward renvoi to the old law. It's basically saying the old law continues. The unusual provision of note is Article 36. If this is a departure from Part 1, it says where Regulation 883 or 987-2009 are amended or replaced after the end of the transition period, references to those regulations in this agreement shall be understood as referring to those regulations as amended or replaced in accordance with the acts listed in Part 2 of Annex 1 of this agreement. So in this one area... There is, in fact, a dynamic renvoi. It doesn't stop at the 1st of January 2021. It's a, it's a reference to the regulation as updated, and then there are obligations on the Joint Committee to revise the annex. Is that because it applies to the million or so UK residents, UK nationals who are living in Europe, as well as to those EU Absolutely. nationals here? They just Absolutely. get symmetrical benefits. Absolutely, and it becomes impossible to continue to affect coordination if one of the coordinating parties is operating to one version of the coordinating regulation and the other 27 are operating to an entirely different instrument. And so the, the solution fixed upon is that they all operate to the latest version of the instrument. Now, the reason that that's significant is I suggest it's the very strongest pointer uh, uh, to the absurdity of the lacuna that would arise in relation to Article 158. It would be very strange if, on the one hand, you're providing for a dynamic interpretation of Regulation 883, and that dynamic interpretation of Regulation 883 has the CJU as its authoritative interpretive master under Article 158, and yet, at the same time, you create a hole in the donut by saying, by reference to the facts falling between these two stools, there's no power to refer. The two concepts really sit jarringly uh, side by side. The last provision I need to show you is Article 158 itself, page 348. This is the uh, page. Uh, page 348, my lord. 348. As yet, unexercised power of reference. I think I'm right in saying that. Ms. Smythe will correct me if I'm wrong. Where, in a case which commenced at first instance within eight years from the end date of transition period before a court of tribunal of the UK, a question is raised concerning the interpretation of part two of this agreement, and where that court or tribunal considers that a decision on that question is necessary to give it judgment, the Court of Tribunal <coughs> may request the Court of Justice to give a preliminary ruling. And then paragraph two makes it plain that the legal effects uh, in the UK of such a preliminary ruling shall be the same as the legal effect of preliminary rulings given under uh, Article 267. So it's continuation in this limited respect of the old order of business. 
and ju just, just so we're looking at the temporal limit in paragraph one, is that saying that any case commenced, so within eight years from the end of the transitional period, any case commenced before 2029? Yes. Now, there's, there's, there's plainly a difference between us, as I, you can be seen from my learned friend, Skeleton Argument. She relies upon that language to say that within eight years means that the events have to occur after IP completion date. In other words, the, the drafting in question is directed only to those facts which arise from the 1st of January 2021 through to the 31st of December, eight years later. So it depends whether your starting point is IP date or it's just within, means any time up to the Before. 2029. Yeah. We say it's a long stop date. She says, no, it's both a beginning period and an end period, effectively. And that is one of the points of departure uh, between us. I don't think that there is an argument between us that, in principle, an argument about the interpretation of Regulation 883 is a question about interpretation of the withdrawal agreement if the facts occur after the 1st of January. I see my learned friend nodding. So because there is a renvoi to Regulation 883, any question about Regulation 883 is a question, to use the words used here, concerning the interpretation of Part 2 of the agreement. Well, it's, it, you're really asking the question of interpretation of Article 31. Exactly, my lord. Exactly. Which actually, by reference, exactly. incorporates everything, including There's Article 48. Nothing between on that, us on that. So I think what is between us, it comes down to the temporal point. And I should say that no court has grappled with this issue before. It did almost arise in the case of Harrington, um, but the point wasn't argued and wasn't ruled upon in the end of that case. So there was a suggestion that there was a power to refer. I think on the basis of Carrington, it was said that there is no power to refer, uh, and we don't accept that. So, so the real crux of the difference is the meaning of the word within. Is yes, it within I the think period it is. From IP date to eight years, or any point before the end of eight years from IP date, 2029. Just to clarify, my Lord, it's also this, that there can't be a question concerning the interpretation of part two in circumstances where it wasn't in force at material time. That's the other point that Secretary of State makes. Well, it's, so the question is, first line is, in a case which commenced, uh, and a question is raised, so when was it commenced? Yes. And then it, the question is raised at some later point after commencement. Yes, the, the point the Secretary of State makes essentially depends on Section 12.8b of the Social Security Act, which means that the court is confined to looking at the position as at the date of the decision. So that's the specific exactly. nuance in this case, that yes. at that point the withdrawal Absolutely. agreement wasn't enforced. Absolutely. But I agree with Mr Delamere on his other point. So there are two temporal aspects. The temporal aspect is when the case commences, and secondly, when the, case, when the facts giving rise to the dispute arose because they'll set the relevant operative law. But you've got where, in a case, yeah. a question concerning the interpretation arises. So it's in a case. Are we in a case in which a question has arisen? Yes. And this is very like the issues that have um, arisen about the scope of the power to refer, where a national court thinks that... Um, Let's say, I can't remember the name of the case, one of them was where it's competition law is word for word the same as Article 81 as was, and they refer a question on Article 81 because that's going to answer the question of domestic law. We say uh, that's exactly analogous to the present case, and it's accepted that as long as the National Court has a proper basis for thinking it's useful, it must be able to refer. So the does, does your proposition really come to this? That, uh, adopting what the Europeans call a teleological approach we should read the word within as meaning not later than. Yes. Yes, and that applies to both when the case is commenced and when the facts relate. The key thing is that the legal point in question must be one that is continuing. In other words, uh, the debate about Regulation 883-2004 is exactly the same debate before and after I, uh, IP completion date, as it is. 
that's the issue. And we say, purposive or teleological interpretation, we're right. If you're not with us, you should refer, if you're otherwise minded to refer, which I appreciate is a big if. Um, so, well, if, if, if we were minded to refer, we might ask both questions to be fair. Yes, yes absolutely. So, topic five, status of pre-IP completion date law. There's no dispute here. I would note, however, that the Secretary of State's position is somewhat coy. It's not an acceptance of the bindingness of the uh, pre-IP completion day case law. It's a stance where the Secretary of State is saying that they don't invite the court to depart from the pre-IP completion day case law. And I think that's a, 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 a careful emphasis of the reservation of any points as may be made for a future date. Um, but such as it is, that there we are. We don't need to get bogged down in Lipton, um, much as the EU anorak in me would love to do so. So, uh, topic six. Um, it's at this juncture, I'm going to hand over for 15 minutes or so to my learned friend, Mr. Castle, who's going to walk you through the notes and explain how the benefits are then met. My lords, my lady. Um, in order to make this point, um, Mr. Delamo has trailed that we do have the legislation that is in the note. I wonder if I could hand these up. now is the relationship between child element of universal credit and child tax credit. As Mr. Delamere has shown you, the upper tribunal in this case called child element the descendant of child tax credit. It goes further than this. These benefits are designed to flow into each other such that child element is, in very many cases, continuity child tax credit albeit potentially triggering different amounts of payments. And when one is substantively changed, both are changed. The detail of this is given in the short note we filed at the court yesterday, referring to my learned friends at the same time. Um, it's filed to assist the court with areas that it may well not be familiar. And hopefully, the note speaks for itself, that there is a very strong family resemblance so that the child, child tax credit is recognisable in a child element. There is a, one element in particular I would like to amplify orally, and that's to discuss the common purposes and conditions for the grant of child element and child tax credit, because as, as Mr. Delamere will come on to, the purpose and conditions for the grant of a benefit <coughs> are important when considering coordination. So, the first point is that both allowances have the same basic conditions. If I could ask you, to to, please, to go to page two of the supplementary bundle I just handed up. These set out two of the conditions for child tax credit. This is section three of the Tax Credits Act 2002. And section 3.3 three provides for two things, an age requirement, i.e. at least 16, and presence in the United Kingdom. There is also a means test for child tax credit, which is at section 7 of the same Act, 
which is in the legislation bundle at page four. And it's section seven one, two chief criteria. First is that you don't exist, ex exceed the income threshold. Second, if you exceed that threshold, when the calculation is done, there has to be, quote, a rate. Sorry, where did you get that from? That is 7-1-B, my lord. 7-1-B? Exceeding the income threshold by only so much. A determination in accordance with the regulations under Section 13.2, that's the um, income taper provisions, provides a rate of the tax credit. Yeah. The import of that is that if there is no rate, um, then entitlement disappears. One might think a rate is zero. In fact, the regulations provide that it's £26. Um, that's Regulation 9. You don't have to go there, but that's um, page 36 of the supplementary bundle. That's the means test in child tax credit. If I could now ask you to take up the main authorities bundle and look at the equivalent provisions for universal credit. <coughs> Conditions are behind tab four in the welfare reform act, sections three, four, and five. And that is at page 32 of the authority Three simply points you to two further provisions, either basic conditions and further financial conditions. The basic conditions are over the page at section four. So section one. A, um, here it is 18 years old. The age is lowered to 16 by regulations where the claimant is responsible for a child or qualifying young person. And that is, I'll give you the bundle reference, um, 37 of the supplementary bundle, regulations 8.1D and 8.1E in the case of a couple. Sticking with Section 4 of the Welfare Reform Act, 4.1c is a provision concerning the residency of the claimant. 4.1d is not receiving education. Again, that is disapplied in the circumstances of a claimant responsible for a child or qualifying young person. That regulation is at 40 in the supplementary legislation bundle, and it's regulation 141C for E universal credit regulations. And fifth, basic conditions accepted a claimant commitment. Well, what is that? I am looking for what it meant. I couldn't see it immediately. A claimant, a claimant commitment is defined in section 14, which unfortunately you don't have, but oh, it is a... That's why I couldn't find it. Yes. <laughs> well, um, it's a record of the claimant's responsibilities in relation to an award of universal credit. That's the definition. Um, the entitlement condition is that you accept your responsibilities. Those responsibilities are... Um, I, I should also say, if, if you do accept those responsibilities, you don't perform them, that doesn't affect entitlement to universal credit. It, it means that you may be sanctioned, i.e. you lose your, the amount of benefit, the entitlement remains. Um, the things, you, the responsibilities are things like 
work-related activities, work searches, etc. And the changes to the basic conditions of eligibility clearly align child element with child tax credit, i.e. available for someone over the age of 16, whether in education or not, whether in work or not. Um, they are entirely aligned. Section 5 Welfare Reform Act is then the means test. That's at page 34 of the authorities. And that differs because it now takes capital into account, whereas Correct. it didn't before. Is that Correct. But it is otherwise, it's otherwise a, a test based on income. And you again see at 5.1b the same mechanism applies, i.e. if you, if, if, when the sums are done, you would receive less than a prescribed amount, entitlement disappears. For universal credit, it's a penny. So, same mechanism of the test, of the means test. Um, there are also specific requirements. The, the more specific requirements, I responsibility for a child, are worded in precisely the same terms. If we can compare Section 8.1 of the Tax Credits Act, that is at page 6 of the Supplementary Legislation Bundle. 6, uh, 8.1, I apologize. Last sentence fragment. So page 6 of the Supplementary Bundle. Page 6 of the Supplementary, Section 8. So paragraph one, I apologize. Entitlement is on being responsible for one or more children or qualifying young persons. That's child tax credit. Similar wording in section 10.1 of the Welfare Reform Act, which is in the main authority for your 38. Children, a, a child for both regulations, is someone who is not yet 16. That's um, regulation two of the child tax credit regulations, page 17 of the supplemental. looking at the definition, similarity of the definition. Yes. That's right, my lord. Child is a person who has not yet attained the age of 16. So, I mean, they're, they're similar, not identical. The definition of child is the same. No, I mean, ac across the board from entitlement, financial contribution, so on. Your, your point is there's a high degree of similarity. There is a... There is an identity, and where they're not identical, they differ in terms of the um, the amounts involved. The mechanism is the same. Yes, that's the point, isn't it? The mechanisms are the same, even if the details are variable to a degree. Yes. So you say, therefore, since it was treated one way before the 2012 Act, it, it, it yes, because of the similarity, it doesn't... Because of the difference, it doesn't prevent them being said. I just finally want to take the court orally to the definition of qualifying young person. Yeah, where are we? Um, we are at, behind tab 8 at page 105 of the main authorities. This is Regulation 5 yeah. uh, of the 
the new rules of credit regulations. The features of the qualifying young person are set out relatively clearly here. Regulation 5.1 caps the age of a qualifying young person at 20. And 1.B makes a requirement for a 19-year-old to be in approved training or a course of education which is not advanced education. They have to still be at school. Essentially, school or college, not university level. Five <clears> two, <throat> uh, they have to be there um, before before they attain nineteen. I should also say five one B three. There's a minimum of twelve hours. Five five excludes those in receipt of benefits, certain benefits. If I could then take you through the equivalent in the child tax credit regulations, that is at tab seven, seventy six point seventy six. Tab seven, did you say? Tab seven. The main, the main bundle, yes. Yeah. So this is, I, I parachuted you into Regulation 2, the Child Tax Credit Regulations on interpretation. You'll see there at the bottom of page 76, you can open up a definition for qualifying young person. other than a child who, over the page A, not attained the age of 20, B, satisfies regulation 5, 3, and 4. And if I could then ask you to take up the supplementary legislation bundle. So that's at par uh, page 27 in the supplementary. Yes, ma'am. submission again is it's the same. 5.3a and ab mirror regulation 5.1b of the universal credit regulations. So we're receiving approved training for advanced education not for virtue of employment. 3 capital A over the page makes the same provision for people aged 19. 9.5.2 of the Universal Credit Regulations. And then 5.4 mirrors the requirement not to be in receipt of benefit. And 5.5 specifies amongst other things the length of time being at school or college in secondary education. So both are um, both benefits for claimants who are responsible for the same um, for the same class of person. Um, the test also is the same. And I would simply ask you, um, because my time is running short, uh, to compare Regulation 3 of the Child Tax Credit Regulations, that is of 21 and 22 of the Supplementary Bundle, with provision at 101 of the Main Bundle. Yeah. Which is regulation four of the universal credit regulations. Two tests, normally living with 
if normally living with more than one person, it's a main responsibility test. Unless I can be of any further assistance on those points, I'll hand back to Mr. Delamare. Thank you. The last um, nail in the coffin on this particular issue is I would suggest the judgment of the Supreme Court in SC, which is the case on the two child rule, where the legality of the two child rule was looked at through the lens of child tax credits. But um, the court was uh, pleased to point out in its uh, authority um, 40 uh, and the speech of Lord Reed um, setting out the background to the litigation starting at paragraph three. Paragraph, paragraph, um, paragraph three, page uh, six, that's uh, so a 937 through to uh, paragraph 10. Uh, at page uh, 939 that explains the structure of child, child child credits, the changes introduced uh, by the two change uh, the two child rule, etc., and how effectively the same changes were made at the same time to universal credit. And the note we've um, uh, supplied identifies the identical changes with the identical exceptions for multiple births. You know, what happens if you have one child and then you have twins? That's an exception. It's the same exception in both provisions. But the two-child rule was only introduced for two benefits. It was introduced for child tax credits and the child element of universal credit and nothing else. And there are any number of other changes like that that can be pointed to that when they're amended substantively, they're amended together. So um, that's the enmeshing issue. Can we now... Um, Pass to the issues about um, the case law. And the case law, in my submission, falls in relation to three propositions. First of all, the case law on categorisation. How does the Social Security Benefits uh, Coordination Regulation categorise things as Social Security Benefits, SNC, CDs, or Social Assistance? The point my Lord's made to me a few times. The second is why CRD case law is unhelpful. That's the case of Bray. And the third is the case law on the technique of severance. That's Commission and Parliament and Barclays. I'll try to get through as much of that as I can before um, 4.30. So uh, the first topic, categorisation uh, under the regulation. The point to note here is that this case law is relevant, despite the Secretary of State suggesting otherwise, to the topic of severance. Because that which is relevant to categorisation must be relevant when you're looking at the question of severance, and that which is irrelevant to categorisation must logically be irrelevant to the features of the scheme in relation to severance. And the case in point in that is, is means testing. If means testing isn't relevant to whether or not something's categorised as social security, changes to provisions in relation to means testing or changes in relation to tapering or changes in relation to what income is counted for the purposes of means testing, can't be relevant to the underlying exercise of severance and asking whether or not it's possible. Now, um, the first point to note is that the CJU approaches these topics in a particular order. And the best case for that is the case d'assurance case, tab 33 of the bundle. It's a just pre-Brexit uh, uh, authority. The context was a coordination issue between French and German benefits. And the real question from the French court was whether or not the German benefit was a coordinated family benefit. And that really um, informed the overlapping benefits rules. If the German benefit was mere social assistance, it means it wouldn't be taken into account for the purposes of the overlapping benefit rules, and that would lead to an increase in the French benefit payable. You see that from paragraph 31. Uh, the um, questions referred is at paragraph uh, 22, page six, 769. First question, does the German assistance fall within the material scope? And um, the analysis starts at 24. And you see there's a logical sequence. The first question, in answering the question of is it um, 
in the benefit of uh, is it social assistance or not? The first uh, question is it's necessary to determine whether or not it's a social security benefit for purposes of Article 3. Well, then the various tests will come back to a set out. And then having asked that question, <coughs> the second question at 34 is then whether or not it's a SNCB. That's the thing that's asked in the second place. And it's not. It follows, therefore, that the German assistance does not constitute a benefit. Oh, yeah. So that's the logical sequence. Next thing you have to know is what is the test for whether or not something is a social security uh, benefit. Now, this is a topic of long standing, and there's lots of case law on this, and indeed the case d'assurance case is one amongst uh, others. Uh, there is a two stage test composed of two questions. First of all, are you addressing one of the risks in the regulation? Secondly, is it an entitlement, a right, or is it discretionary? Sorry, the, the, the court's decision was that the German provision yes. was not a social security benefit. That's right. And that meant, effectively, that it wasn't to be taken into account for the purposes of the overlapping benefit rules. So, in other words, when working out how much you were to be paid in France, you didn't take the German provision into, uh, into account because it wasn't a social security benefit. And it wasn't a social security benefit, is this right? Because... The, the substantive it, test at 27. Is yeah, right. so you, it's got to be without any individual and discretionary assessment of personal needs. That's right. And it's got to relate to one of the listed risks. That's right. So those are the two, those are the two tests you have to meet. It has to be entitlement rather than discretion, as yeah. current summaries. And it has to be in relation to one of the two risks. And that means that some schemes of advantage, let's call it, that is a neutral word. Right may meet the test of non-discretionary, but fail the test of meeting one of the objectives of the regulation. Uh, and the reasoning is in powers 30 and 31, why it fails the test. Exactly. It's, it's not subject to uh, objective criteria. Yes. And... It's available according to individual needs. Exactly. So they look at your particular case and decide how much you personally are going to get. A bit like payments under the Children's Act and other forms of discretionary assistance in relation to, say, funeral payments and things like that, where you can have discretionary sums. So that's the essence. It's not plug your numbers into the algorithm and the algorithm tells you the answer. It's an individual decision maker listens to your facts and decides in their discretion how much you're going to get. But it's important to appreciate that that analysis means that there will be some benefits that meet the first limit test, i.e. they're not discretionary, but fail the second because they don't address one of the risks. And the classic instance of that is the Herx case about the Belgian Minimex which is basically a um, minimum subsistence benefit designed to protect against poverty. And the essence of that case, tab 18, I'll just give you the reference, of paragraphs 12 to 14, page 364, is that the minimex cannot be classified under one of the branches of Social Security listed in what was then Article 4, now Article 3. And for that reason, although it was automatic, it wasn't a social security benefit. And that's the basis on which things like housing benefits, income support, are not uh, coordinated social security benefits. They pass the first limb, fail the second limb. And what that means is, to go back to the point my Lord has asked me, there is no active set test for social assistance. It's a residual test. It's everything that's left after you've failed these uh, tests. And that's why you can't effectively do as the upper tribunal did, and as the Secretary of State invites you to do, you can't start by asking whether universal credit is social assistance. You've got to start by asking, is it, or is aspects of it, severance, social security benefit? That's the focal point of uh, the beginning of the inquiry. 
So in the questions that um, Miss Smythe asks in her skeleton, you say she's got them the wrong way around? Yes. Can I just help with this? I don't think there's a great deal of difference between us, in fact. I accept those are the two questions that my learned friend has identified. I, I, I have noted that she accepts that they're the two questions, but nevertheless, the reasoning proceeds on the basis of starting to ask whether or not what is before you is social assistance. And no analysis, you, you decide whether it's social assistance probably by looking to see whether or not it applies, somebody else properly applies, but maybe it is two sides of the same coin. It, it might be, my lord, but there may, there may be some significance in the actual sequencing of the asking of the questions. Um, now, how do you ascertain whether or not the benefit is targeted at one of the risks in Article 3? You do that um, by looking at uh, uh, the, the generality and context of the benefit in question in an objective fashion. And uh, the case of INPS, Authority Bundle 35, it's a post-IP completion date decision, but it's really nothing more than a, a compendious summary of pre-IP com day completion, IP completion day authority. And I don't think its summary of the previous case law is contentious. I'll, I'll be told if I'm wrong. Um, it's tab 35 of the bundle. And the reason we've included it is it's a grand chamber decision. And that generally means a bit more care is taken about the assembly of the principles. Um, and you can pick things up at page 798. Uh, it's tab um, 35. Page 798, power 52. And you can see, here's the test. It's based essentially on the constituent elements of each benefit, and in, and in particular whether its purpose is, purpose, and, and, and here's the critical wording, and the conditions for its grant, and not on whether it's classified as social security benefit by Manchester International Association. It's an ob objective test looking at its purpose and the conditions for its grant. It's the conditions for its grant that's relevant, not means tests, not quantum, not any of that. And we'll see later cases making that point. 53 then repeats the two-stage test that we've just looked at. And then 54 applies it to family benefits. Thus, as regards the first condition referred to in the previous paragraph, the court has declared that benefits are granted automatically to families meeting objective criteria relating in particular to their size, income and capital resources without any discretionary and individual assessment of personal needs and are intended to meet family expenses must be regarded as social security benefits. And Martinez, Silva, uh, and other cases are cited. So there's the test. This is all plugging into the algorithm. This is, yes. So size, income, capital resources are things you plug in. Yes. But then you get your non-discretionary output. As, absolutely. And it also supports your proposition that means testing is not relevant. Exactly. And there's other cases I'm going to show you in a second that um, makes that point uh, good. Then 55 makes that point first, first of all. So far as that condition is concerned, the court has held in relation to benefits which are granted refused, all the amount of which is calculated by taking into account the recipient's resources, that the grant of such benefit does not depend on an individual assessment of the applicant's personal needs, provided that an objective, legally defined criteria gives entitlement to the benefit without the competent authority being able to take other personal circumstances into consideration. In other words, it's enough if there's an algorithm and that there is no intrusion of discretion into the regime. And then um, 57, you have the benefits, uh, uh, family benefits def defined uh, further um, by reference to the definitions of the regulation um, and uh, why definition applied. And then at 60, they um, emphasise, in this particular context, the principle from Hughes. It follows that childbirth allowance is a family benefit within the meaning. It's of little importance in that regard whether that allowance has a dual function, namely, as the referring court states, both of a contribution to the costs resulting from the birth or adoption of a child and that of a premium intended to encourage the birth rate, since one of those functions relates to the branch of Social Security. So... 
uh, in that case, encouraging birth rate, in the case of uh, a, a benefit addressing poverty, the dual object of supporting families and providing minimum subsistence incomes. Then, um, can I ask you to look very briefly at the CW case, which is tab 34, the one immediately beforehand. This is one of the cases um, turning on the hinge between sickness benefits and invalidity benefits. Uh, and as um, is reasonably clear, um, there was in fact a three-way tussle over classification of the benefit. The tussle was, was it a sickness benefit? Was it an invalidity benefit? Or uh, was it, in fact, an unemployment benefit? And you can see that from the statement of facts culminating in question one at page uh, 780. <laughs> Basically asking, how do we categorise it from the list? And that is then answered uh, at uh, paragraphs 29 and following. And... Um, the points are made. First of all, characteristics which are purely formal mustn't be considered relevant criteria for the classification of benefits, and that would include things like procedures applied or, or used, or time limits, or things like that. They can't be conceivably relevant. Sorry, just which paragraph is that? Paragraph 30. And that also emphasises that um, the characteristics specific to different national legal systems um, are not relevant. So it's according to settled case law, and it's done irrespective of the characteristics specific to different national legal systems. And then where there are multiple options in play, multiple options as between the list in Article 3, it's necessary to um, uh, ask uh, effectively which risk is being addressed, each must be taken into account. And the essence of the test thereafter is a careful parsing of the benefit to see which of the candidates the purpose and characteristics correspond to most closely. And that's exactly what they do in this case. And as they so often have done, they concluded at the end of it, but 41, that the answer was applying that test, that it was a sickness benefit. So so what is, what, can I, just, what is the, the benefit? What is the benefit? Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's uh, in paragraph 9, is it? Yes, it's the Austrian allowance in this case. The rehabilitation allowance. So this is not a case in which the court severs anything. It's not a severance case. As I, I hope I emphasise, my lord, that there are, so far as we can see, only two out-and-out -out severance cases. They're Commission and Parliament and Bartlett. Um, and in that respect, uh, uh, Judge Jacobs is completely right. That's the totality of the case law on severance. So this is, this is addressing categorisation, but nevertheless, the process of categorisation informs the exercise, we suggest, of uh, whether or not a benefit is severable or not. Because it, it tells you what you're looking for in order to find a social security benefit. And that must be then helpful for working out whether or not things are distinct according to that criterion. So uh, two further cases, I think, that then show how this works in principle. The first and the most important of these is Commission of the UK. That's tab 31. This is the case that decides CTC is a family benefit. It was infraction proceedings brought against the UK for the application to um, child tax credit of what's called the... So sorry, I'm just, just slowly catching up. Paragraph tab? Tab uh, 31. 31. 31. So the background to this is the so-called HRT test, the habitual residence test, which was a test, I think, that was rolled out from around about the mid-noughties to control access to non-contributory uh, non means-tested social security benefits to effectively ensure that the parties in receipt of them were affiliated to the UK um, uh, 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 tax and contribution system and were effectively benefit tourists. 
And there had been a spate of cases testing the um, applicability or not of, or the lawfulness or not of the HRT test from the principle of the law of non-discrimination. This case sought to argue that the HRT test was unjustifiable indirect discrimination because it was being applied to a coordinated benefit uh, under uh, the regulation. And that was the essence of the complaint made by the Commission. Um, I would um, commend the Advocate General's opinion to you, um, starting at page 714, not least because he sounds the warning bells uh, at um, paragraph 2 to 3 and 43 and other places about confusing Regulation 883's concept <coughs> of social assistance with that under the Citizens' Rights Directive. But the, um, the key passage in the AGO is um, at paragraphs 43 to 47, page 723, where he says, applying the settled case law of the court, that CTC is a family benefit. And you see the same analysis in the court's analysis. And I ask you to start with page 742, paragraph 17, where they summarise child tax credits. And they say that the UK is saying that the objective pursued by the enactment is combating child poverty. So not a family benefit, it's combating child, benefit, child poverty. Child tax credit is paid to a person or persons responsible for one or more children. It's a means-tested benefit, the amount of which decreases on a sliding scale once family income exceeds a, th a threshold amount, and which depends on the number of children in the family. So all the points about means testing and tapering are made, and the tax credit regime replaced various payments that were made to recipients of means-tested benefits on the basis of them being responsible for children, and it's met out of general taxation. Notwithstanding those features, the court, first of all, uh, emphasises... Um, that the real argument, this is paragraph 28, is that the HRT test is inconsistent with the regulation. And then it goes on, first of all, to decide whether or not it is to be classified as a social security benefit. And that passage is at 749 under the heading Findings of the Court, paragraphs 54 to 60. Yeah. And the conclusion is, in particular, applying the case of Hughes that says that benefits may have dual functions, but notwithstanding its means testing, notwithstanding its tapering, it's a coordinated benefit under the scheme of the regulation. They then go on to find, as it happens, that because it amounts to social assistance, for the purposes of the Citizens' Rights Directive, it's lawful to apply a habitual residence test to initial entitlement. But the critical point is here that for the purposes of the regulation, they found it to be a coordinated benefit. And they say it's 59, despite its name, it's a sum which the competent authority pays periodically to the recipients and which seems to be associated with their status as taxpayers. It's granted automatically to families that meet certain objective requirements, etc., etc., etc. Yeah. So the means test and taper are immaterial, and the fact that there's another uh, aim of alleviating poverty is immaterial. And then the last case to show that this is no outlier. Well, I think if we're going to a different case, Mr. Lamer, that's where we stop. Thank you, Mel. Ten thirty tomorrow. Going to get my skates on tomorrow. Yes. Well, we normally rise at four fifteen, rather than four thirty. That's great for me. Ten thirty tomorrow. Bye. Right. You have to sit in suspense, Jim. Sit in suspense, Jim, overnight.